This episode is brought to you by Imagine Strength, your go-to for safe, simple, and effective high-intensity training equipment. Growing a successful high-intensity training business requires workout equipment that's not only high quality, but also intelligently designed to fit the unique needs of your studio. And that's where Imagine Strength comes in. Drawing on the wisdom of the legendary Arthur Jones, Imagine Strength has crafted a groundbreaking line of fitness equipment that's as affordable as it is efficient, giving your studio the upgrade it needs without breaking the bank. The team at Imagine Strength breathes hit. Their passion for high intensity training shines through in their designs, which they've consistently refined and innovated for optimum effectiveness and user experience. From my personal experience at REC, I can attest to the careful consideration and craftsmanship that goes into every single piece. My Imagine Strength workout was absolutely brutal, in a good way, of course. Now, what makes Imagine Strength truly stand out? They have innovative equipment tailored for the unique needs of HIT studios, affordable and efficient designs, lowering the barriers to entry for a HIT business, continuous innovation and refinement, ensuring your studio stays ahead of the curve. Founder Jeff Turner and his team are dedicated to moving the HIT industry forward and making strength training accessible to more people than ever before. Here's how you get started. Number one, visit imaginestrength.com. Number two, discuss your specific needs with the team. And number three, select the equipment that will propel your business to the next level. Head to imaginestrength.com today and give your HIT business the Imagine Strength edge. Be part of the HIT revolution and see firsthand how their unique equipment can transform your studio's workout experience. Elevate your HIT business with Imagine Strength. Lauren Snell here and welcome back to High Intensity Business, your one-stop shop for elevating your HIT business and fueling your passion for high intensity training. Before we dive into today's episode, grab your free step-by-step -step PDF guide on how to turn your business into a robust referral machine. Download that now over at highintensitybusiness.com forward slash ref, that's R-E-F short for referral. You'll also get a full length video training with Luke Carlson, who's the CEO and founder of Discover Strength on how to build a referral machine. And you'll also get access to lots of free resources, including hit business guides, checklists, and much, much more. Just go to highintensitybusiness.com forward slash ref to download that. This is episode 422. And I didn't know how else to title this, but a catch up with a um, hit legend, shall we say, David Landau. David is the owner of Advanced Exercise located in Miami, Florida, which offers high-tech training in all phases of the HIT Nautilus protocol. He is a highly respected HIT trainer with over 40 years of experience and rubs shoulders with many of the world's greatest exercise thinkers, bodybuilders, and all-time strongmen. Over the years, Landau has amassed one of the largest exercise archive collections in the country. Um, stimulated by doing extensive personal historical research, he has written several controversial articles and his reputation for being brash and outspoken on training and nutrition has turned him into a bit of a controversial figure in health and fitness. You can improve your hit results with David Landau's consultations. You can contact David over on Facebook. Just search David Landau, L-A-N-D-A-U, yep. Or email xarchives, E-X-A-R-C-H-I-V-E-S at AOL.com. Those links will also be on highintensitybusiness.com episode 422. David, great to see you. How are you doing? Always good to talk to you. Always good. Likewise. I appreciate you making the time to come on and I'm excited to just catch up today. Um, I guess the first thing I wanted to ask you actually is you recently posted some pictures of you and Ken Hutchins hanging out. Is that, was that recent? Oh yes. Oh yes. That's very recent. Right. Very, very long. <laughs> and, um, I always thought you guys had a bit of difference of opinion. Maybe you still do uh, in terms of speed of movement. Um, would you care to share how your relationships evolved or whether you still have differences in, uh, in opinion on those things? And I mean, obviously we'd love to know some of the stuff that was spoken about that's related to exercise, if you're willing to share. We don't talk about that. It's a amazing mutual respect with me and Mr. Hutchins. Um, recently I visited him, I believe about, it was about two months ago and I drove up to meet him at our place, Arby's. We always meet at Arby's where we sit there for a couple hours and talk, but we basically talk about world government issues, philosophy, history, 
he's an amazing genius uh, to speak to. But I can tell you personally that I'm one of the very few people that he'll speak to these days from what I know. And uh, it's always a pleasure seeing them. But we don't talk about exercise other than maybe some few people in the industry. But that's it. We talk about more important issues than that. Fair enough. And um, did you have any luck trying to convince him to come on the show? Ken, if you're listening, you have an open invite to the podcast. David, I've never been able to get Ken onto the podcast. Well, so maybe one day. Well, through me, I'll, I'll try and get him to come on. Um, I'll do my best. I'll text him as soon as we're done with this <laughs> interview. And um, let's see where it goes. Hopefully he has the respect to do it. It's up to him. I, I, just... hope, he do, I hope he does. <laughs> it's all but good. We're, like I said, we're really good friends, believe it or not. But we don't discuss specifics on exercise. Um, I've learned a lot from him. I've learned a lot about especially language from him. Um, his referrals of books and... Can you elaborate on that language? Things of the that? night are, have been very valuable to my uh, knowledge. What do you mean by that, David? When you say language, what have you learned about Well, um, grammar, language. He turned many people on to a gentleman by the name of Richard Mitchell, the underground grammarian. And to sum up, Richard Mich Mitchell is less than words can say, which is his first book. So I got into language. I got into word meanings, word origin meanings, many things that, how the language has been bastardized and things of that nature. I see. So etymology, that kind of stuff. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I thought you, I guess, I guess I thought you were talking more about the language of exercise. Obviously that's part of it. Um, and how, go ahead. Not, not that at all. Okay. Although he's made some comments about that, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I just file them in my, my head. Sounds good. And, you know, the main thing is, of course, it's good to see that he is in better health now, it seems. He went for a real rough patch there for a while. Um, so at least that's, that's great to see, you know. And uh, whether he wants to come on the podcast or not, that's, that's no issue. It's, the most important thing is that he is in a better place in terms of his health. As far as I can see. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. But I'll be up there again. I'll, I'll, I'll drive up there again to, to, uh, me with, I, yeah, I enjoy that. That's part of meeting him and Mr. Flanagan and my brothers in the neighborhood. He's the priority. Sounds good. I love that. I love the, the tightness of this community. It's good to see that you guys all still kind of connected and hang out with each other. Um, the next thing I really wanted to get into, David, is this new protocol. This was really the catalyst for this conversation. You're very excited. You Facebooked me. You started talking about training to failure and multiple sets. We then had a brief phone call and you told me about how to apply this protocol to leg extension. Tell us about this protocol that you're talking about. Yeah, just start there and we'll go from there. I wasn't planning on developing a new protocol. This is all by accident. Like I said, using the leg extension as an example. The keys to exercise is the degree of momentary muscular failure. I won't go into the details of it because that's what I want to consult people on. But I've discovered the thing is, here's the base. Many years ago, I met a man by the name of Bob Sands. He was a genius in exercise. He owned three gyms, if I didn't mention this before, in Miami back in the 1950s. If you ever met him, he was kind of a strange looking guy. He always had this glaring look on his face. But I knew then, as I knew, today that he was just very analytical 
And he came up with the concept of systemic effect. He told me this like well over 30 years ago. So you have the argument of single set to failure versus multiple sets. Well, logically, going by sy systemic aspect of physical training, what's going to happen is anytime you do more than one set, it's multiple. Okay. More than one set in any exercise routine becomes multiple and it's systemic. So everybody's out there doing these split routines. How the hell do you do a split routine when exercise is systemic? If I'm doing a pullover with a, with a heavy dumbbell on a bench, I'm working my shoulders, I'm working my chest, I'm working my triceps, I'm working my abdominals, and to anchor that son of a gun, I'm even getting stimulus into my legs as I would in a chin-up or a dip. There's no such thing as isolation. You can attempt to isolate, but you're still going to get a systemic response. So the idea is multiple sets versus single sets to failure is a moot is moot. It's, it's really, it's not debatable, but you have to find out a right amount of exercises for each individual that you train. What do you mean it's not Some debatable? That one do... set, that one set is perfectly valid. Well, once you, once you, once you do a second set, all bets are off. But you think there's you a place for I mean? yeah. But you think there's a place for multiple sets. Well, I, I believe that. No, let me rephrase that. I see that in certain aspects, multiple applications stimulate more muscle growth. That doesn't mean you're in the gym for hours. I can still get that workout done in inside of thirty minutes. Okay. You know who uh, Arthur Jones was best friends with way back? He met him in the early 90s. A gentleman by the name of Thomas DeLorme. Are you Are familiar with him? Yes. And what did he recommend? Well, he I knew recommended I, three sets. He, oh, he recommended I, three yes. sets. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Obviously. DeLorme Watkins, right? There you go. Mm -hmm. I appreciate your knowledge. Yeah. Um, what was the name of the book? Um, the Lord yeah, I can't, I, like I can't recall. I can't recall. Progressive Resistance Exercise, PR, mm -hmm. PRE. Okay. And um, basically, they were great friends. They didn't argue about three sets versus one set. Matter of fact, DeLorme liked the one set principle. But again, let's go off into the foundation. Exercise is physical medicine, it's dosage. And you got to find out the right exact amount for each person, which is next to impossible, but you can try. And when experimenting with applications of more than one, In exercise, I saw better response. And let me reiterate, you will not be in the gym for over an hour, not even close to an hour in most, most, mostly all cases. You can get the workout done inside of 30 minutes. So basically it's a cum cumulative effect. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Let's, let's try and give, give listeners some real practical take on this. Cause I feel like we're being very esoteric, David, we're not really getting to like something that's really going to, I feel like help people, right. And we want to, we want to inform people, want to educate them so that they can take this knowledge, this wisdom and apply it to their own workouts. 
So if we're so going on, the, 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 on on this thread we're talking about, pulling on this thread, what does that look like in terms of, a, can we talk about a workout protocol, a program? I know that, I don't know if you still do this, but previously you would never have a program. You just go in and do what you felt like doing. And that seemed like a very experienced approach to training. I mean, I do that sometimes. I just go, oh, today I feel like I want to do this movement, this movement. And it's just kind of go by feel. Um, but I think beginners struggle with that lack of guidance sometimes. So maybe just give us a workout you did this week and tell me how you applied some of this new thinking to that workout. I think that's really helpful to hear that. Could you, would you be able to go into that? Sure, I can. Yeah. You don't pre-plan a fist fight. You don't pre-plan. I still chart everything in my workouts. And obviously for the for the clients get charted. So basically I'll go into an exercise and I'm thinking about the muscles. I'm thinking about speed of movement, trying to direct the work towards the muscles. And sometimes, believe it or not, I use Darden's 30, 30, 30 on particular exercises once in a while. Use the feel on that is really good. But in some cases, I, I don't think about, again, speed of movement. So it's like if I trained you, I'm going to give you an example. If I trained you, let's say if we start on, let's say, uh, chest press. Let's say, for example, mm -hmm. and you do a chest press and I watch you. And I see that I can't see what I want out of that first set. I'm going to give you a second one. There may be a psychological, maybe a look on your face that I could have done better. Or maybe anatomically, I feel that I need to enhance that with one more. May the high intensity gods come crashing down on me. But no, no, I like this. This is I, probably... This is very useful. I know what you mean. I know exactly I what you mean. I have to look at you as a person. Does that mean I don't train people one set to maximum muscular momentary effort? No, I have a few women that I train. I have one that recruits such a high level of muscle that any more than that would be counterproductive. How, what is her, what, how much volume does she tend to do? That's interesting. Believe it or not, she does about six or seven exercises inside of 18 minutes. And that's, and she's toast after that. Because and of any more pressure. than that, any more than that would be very counterproductive. Because she wouldn't be able to recover so, from, from the dosage. She wouldn't be able to recover during the day. I mean, that's, just, just this amount of, uh, systemic override of her muscles. She recruits a high level of muscle mass. And the dosage has to be specific. It's all about dosage. Remember, it's not all about, oh, like I'm going to do this for anything. It's dosage. Okay. And what do you mean by that dosage? Oh, just like, um, you go to the pharmacy and you pick up your prescription then you find out that prescription is not doing you too well. You're having a bad after effect or whatever. You go back there and they adjust the amount. Some people can take one pill. Some people can take a quarter of a pill. Or maybe people need three pills. You have to find out that in exercise if you're a concerned perfectionist about this. So let's just stop there for a second. This is interesting. I think this is a really difficult thing to figure out. So let me just make, see if I want to this correct. Damn yeah, right it is. It's very, very difficult to figure out. <laughs> You're talking about, so the, the, the uh, metaphor you, you say there is the minimum effective dose kind of idea, the, the, the medicine uh, framework for this. So in terms of exercise, we're talking about, okay, what's an individual's dose of stimulus to, let's say, their bicep, for example, that they need to provide on a weekly basis or session by session basis 
in order to develop the muscular gains that they they have potential to produce, right? So, however, that's a that's a very complex dynamic because there, as we all know, there's so many factors that affect one's recovery and producing that muscle mass in terms of sleep, stress. You know, I've just been through the most stressful few years of my life, raising two young children, two and four years old. Um, and I made no attempt to really make any kind of like personal best in terms of muscle gain. I still trained as hard as I could every time I did, but I also kind of accepted the limitations and the constraints of my life at that time. And it's still hard, but I've coming out the other end of that where I'm starting to find more, uh, more, a little bit more free time and a little bit less stress and more capacity for recovery and results. So anyway, I'm digressing a bit there, but what I'm trying to explain is there's obviously a lot of variables that we're wrestling with when trying to figure out what is the ideal dose. So David, like if someone's listening to this and they're, they're, they're either a passionate trainer and, or they're just a trainee who wants to get big, right? Wants to put on more muscle mass. And we know there's some genetic limitation to that, but let's just say we want to like, you know, optimize as much as we can. How do we figure out this dosage idea? How do we understand how do we get a better understanding of what is the optimal dosage for our muscles in order to produce the best results is what I'm trying to ask you. Just confidence here. You're going to come down and see me. I can, I can figure it out for you. <laughs> yeah, well, now everyone can come I mean, to uh, Miami, it, Florida. It's, it's, it's really hard. <laughs> it's really hard. If you don't meet the person, you meet the, you see somebody in person. You have what, to observe. But David, person. what's the point of us doing a podcast? It's we not can't like a that. Zoom workout or anything like that. You have to see them breathing. You got to see the person themselves and analyze them and take them through a few se sessions, which I'm always open to do. You want to fly in and come and train? I can figure out that for you. Yeah, but David, if, what's, the, what's, the, what's the point? What's the point in us doing the podcast if we can't help people with this, right? Like in lieu well, of that, or can we say? Basically, you know, if. Okay, whatever one set the failure means because it presents itself differently across the board. As I've told you before, I've trained people in one set the so-called failure, whatever failure means, because again, it has a different meaning for each, each person. In other words, it represents itself differently across the board. Again, being redundant. I used to have trainees that literally would be my shadow after I trained them to failure on the, the next exercise. I would have trainees that literally would lay on the floor after one set. Uh, it's so, and that should bring up red flags. If you're laying on the floor after workout, you're killing yourself. Your body's trying to tell you something. So take a step back. We'll, we'll go it and forget about that so-called metabolic conditioning workout. It only makes you better at that particular workout. It's more or less conditions you to be better in the gym, but not outside the gym. Yeah. I, I wish I was wrong, but I'm not wrong. What I'm saying is, and I'm going to tell for the trainees. Do not rush to the next exercise. Give yourself a chance to recover momentarily enough for, you know, physiologically and psychologically, you're ready for that next set, but do not race from machine to machine unless that's in the business model itself. Metabolic, so-called metabolic conditioning has you, you've been interviewing people talking about that. It doesn't make you any better. It makes you better at doing that so-called metabolic conditioning workout. Better at that effect. You got to yeah. remember one thing about that. I'm going to go into detail if you want me to. Well, let's, let's, um, I appreciate you giving me the, the opportunity to jump in because we talked about rush factor, which some people call this by a lot in our previous podcast, David. So I wouldn't like to spend too much time here. I'm more interested in talking about this protocol right? The protocol that you talked to me about leg extension, I understand that there has that you obviously want people to, to, to consult people so you can individualize it, but maybe we can just individualize it to me on this podcast, since I'm obviously sharing your knowledge with so many people, All right? So do you think we could do that? So we could talk about how you would in, individualize this protocol for me and do the best we can do on a podcast. 
How's that sound? That's fine. Yeah. So what we'll, what I'll say is, uh, that again, what I told you before, which is the secret training protocol that I developed by accident. I'm excited. By that's a great headline that's right there. Great. That that should be the title of the really, podcast. I was messing around on a leg extension. That's exactly where I was. You can do it on a bicep. You can do it on any machine that allows you for independent movement arms. Okay. And the, it's a matter of putting that, that together. And let me just tell you the responses to that training. The one guy you saw in the video on Facebook, and he wanted me to tell you this, he said he's never, ever experienced a pump in his legs, okay? And you might say, or the people out there, oh, what's, what's a pump mean? I could get pumped by doing lots of repetition. This is meaningful. This is meaningful because this is a guy that's trained for 40 years Nautilus principles. And when I put him on this system, he, ha he gets such a pump in his legs that it was something he's never gotten in 40 years. And that, that's got to tell you something. Believe it or not, when I got under, I also experienced the same feeling. Not beating yourself up on one set, trying to, like I told you before, like Bill Pearl, and people are going to be angry with this, but I don't care. He said to me once, Dave, it's not necessarily to see how far you can stick that ice pick into your eye. There was a saying I, I use, two sayings, by the way. And actually, a few of the trainees repeat them. Know when to say when. Don't kill yourself during a set of exercises. Challenge yourself, train smart, train hard, but no one to shut the set down. That sounds abstract. How do yeah. you know? You have to observe the training. Come on, David. You have to know, you have to know yourself when you're, when you can no longer produce force against that said load, shut it down. David, yeah. I don't know why I like you so much. Cycle, and I'm going to go into varium, variation. If you felt you didn't do good enough on that next set, do an extra set. It mm -hmm. won't hurt you. This is all based fact, on feel. So, yeah, it's absolutely uh, based on feel. Unfortunately, um, like I said, sometimes I'll be in a workout. I'll have a chartered workout with a trainee, and all of a sudden my mind is looking, I'm looking at them. I'm looking at them. I'm not really looking at what works for me. I'm looking at what I want. I see what I need to do with them. Mm -hmm. And I'll change the routine right there. I, my eraser gets worn out. I got to get pencils after pencils because I'm constantly changing a routine in the process of training them because I see certain things that I want to improve. Enhance. So um, we used to do it by, oh, let's follow this routine straight down the line. No, you have to look at the whole aspect of the trainee. So I'm constantly changing up during the routine itself. I have a few people that actually, and this is true, it's not a lie, it's not made up. You people that actually train in other facilities. When they're not with me, they're back and forth. One goes to Orlando and one goes to New Jersey. And when they train with me, they go up and they improve their ability to produce force substantially from training with me. But again, I'm lucky enough to have them to train in those programs and accept those programs. And there is one of the trainers that wants to find out what the hell I'm doing with this guy. Cause every time he goes back, he looks more muscular and he's in his sixties. 
So, I mean, I don't have a miracle solution for everybody, but I can, I'm interested in improvement, not just a program. Forget the program. I'm, I'm looking for ways to improve you. It's not about me, about you. And I have to identify who the hell you are and what makes you tick and how I can make you better. Psychologically, I got a gift of being a motivator there to work uh, for this training. You have a great style. Listen, uh, listening to you train, you've got a very gentle, very nice voice to listen to whilst one is training. And obviously your, your cues are so honed. You can really see that when I was watching a video on Facebook of you training someone. And well, I'd love to observe have, more of that. If you could vi to do more videos. That. To, well, I'll, I'll, I'll post one for you. <laughs> uh, maybe we can do a Zoom workout to where you know, sure. maybe I'll acquiesce to a could Zoom workout. Could try that. Workout. Could try that. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'll acquiesce. I was supposed to do that with a guy from Mexico because he loved what I had. Yeah. yeah. I won't even tell you what he thought about me compared to one of your main people, but I will leave that aside. Yeah, probably I do. <laughs> this is just way it is. Um, no, I'm, you know, I'm, I got, I got, it's DNA. I'm, I, I, it's a gift, uh, but it's concern. It's concern over what, how I can improve somebody. Well, how his... I can improve somebody. I, how is it? What, what makes you, you. I have to look at you from head to toe to see what the hell's going on in order to make that routine successful. It's not based on what I, I think. It's based on what you think. The instruction is only good when you're good. Mm -hmm. My instruction follows you. I don't, it's not a one way street. It takes two to work this thing out to make it good for you. So when I'm instructing somebody, and if I sound good, it's not because of me, it's because of them and what kind of show they're giving me. So I have two things that come to mind. I want to, I do want to get into this protocol. So I'm just going to say what we spoke about the other day. So if people have a genuine understanding of what, how to perhaps apply the first draft of this protocol. You which, want specifics? Yeah, I mean, so if you want, you to, want me to give up my, my secrets or what? With the greatest respect, David, I think it's a good protocol, but it's not original. I've heard the same thing being used before. Maybe I don't understand it well enough. Maybe it is original. But what you told me in terms of the leg extension protocol, it sounds great, but I've heard the same type of thing before, unless I'm incorrect, right? So left leg only to muscle failure. Let's take medics leg extension, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Right leg only to muscle failure, then left again to muscle failure, and then right That's again, right. and then both right. to failure, right? And is it stopped there? No, or no, there... no, there's no arbitrary number there, by the way. What do you mean? Well, so sense? you have to be, I have to judge, I have to be able to judge it when you're ready or when they're ready, basically, and then they'll work it all to maximum muscular failure. And then they'll add okay. another set or maybe two more sets, but you're on, like I said, hmm. just work the prime uh, work. These work remember 30 minutes work out or I was trying to say it. It's just, it's just a, like I said, it doesn't expand your workout time. Your workout time is right where it, where it should be. But again, this has got to be discriminately uh, delivered to the individual. Mm -hmm. uh, it's specific to the individual. Well, let's say I'm doing so it, right? So let's say I do it. And I know we're not observing me doing it. I'm just talking about it. But let's say I go to true muscular failure. I mean, if we kind of, can we not just predefine what that is? It's just, I can't remember the exact definition as a lot of people. The inability to produce force in that particular moment. Right. Enough okay. to finish the movement. Yeah, fine. So let's say that happens. I do that with my left leg. I do it with my right leg. I do it with both legs. What would, I would feel that's quite a bit of, like that, at that point, you've recruited the full spectrum muscle fiber. I don't feel like you need to do any more beyond that. 
assuming you got a muscle failure on all of those those reps no let's take failure and throw it out and say muscular success okay i like success over failure <laughs> now that's gonna upset a lot of people but you don't need to caveat that just, just yeah you know i like to train to succeed not to fail that makes sense to you it does yeah, failure is a negative word. So we're, just we're just talking about we're just talking about objectives. Mr. Just... Flanagan would not like to hear that, but his routines aren't that much different than mine. Yeah, he'll watch this. He'll watch this probably. I'm, I'm sure he's a big fan of you. So, um, so so well, let's just we're just using the word failure because we're just trying to define our terms, aren't we? We're not really trying to worry about how people perceive we're, we're that. We're trying to use a term that's very familiar with just the, objective uh, yeah boxes. right when we say what well, muscular failure means people in our industry know what we're talking about don't they um so so if you're if you've done that right so that's basically taken my my both my quadriceps to failure basically three times um <laughs> well why would one need to do any more than that i feel like that's sufficient volume at least for one workout it may be it may be for you I, I have to judge in the moment. Uh, How would you judge that in the again, moment? Again, it's, 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 it's really judgment goal. You could say, like I said, you could basically see anatomically and, and, and psychologically when they're spent, get them the hell off the machine and move them to the next one. That's all. Okay. You have to see. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's not a one size fits all, nor should any other program be. I hear about these programs. Oh, we're getting results. They're getting stronger. At what? The program itself? Are they getting stronger? Oh, but oh, they're doing these things now. Psychologically, that goes into play. Oh, they're doing things they never done before because you instilled or maybe indirectly instilled confidence in them. Oh, therefore, I lift a lot of weights at the gym. I can do this. Mm -hmm. it ain't bad. But doesn't mean anything unless you're really stronger. Uh, you are able able to uh, do things more efficiently. But most of it's psychological. Physiological is the key. You want to find out a program that allows these people to become physiological strong, physiologically stronger, and that's that's the key. The psychology certainly does pay the bills. But it's not ideal, if that makes sense to you. It does. I guess I feel like, uh, I feel like, obviously, we have a probably a big difference of opinion on this, David. But I, I, I feel like if someone is improving at the key compound movements, you know, if they're, if they're showing serious progress in load and repetitions on like a pull down leg press, chest press, and their form is fantastic. Those movements, they, what's the term? Ecologi high ecological validity, right? They transfer to like real world strength. So if you're improving at those, then, and I would argue that all of our colleagues have a system in their training where that is achieved, then that is, that is getting someone physiologically much stronger. So I don't, I, I, I get confused. I'll be honest with you, I listen to you. I, I don't quite know what you're saying. It's just a bit too abstract for me. Nobody does. Uh, <laughs> That's a problem, though, right? Nobody does. Nobody but, does. But you um, want to be. You want to be let me, let me just Let me just go back to what you said. You said, okay, form. Yeah. Okay. Form. Yeah. If you're interested in form yeah. and again speed of movement, this is going to kill the super slow people. But uh, on the second one, but form, your body picks up this. This is just my opinion, my observation over many years. Fear makes one better at form. In other words, form. Your body senses it as a skill. It really does. Very controversial there, huh? Mm, but the thing is, take a dumbbell in your hand on the second part of this. Take a dumbbell, a light dumbbell in your hand. Mm-hmm. Raise it for one second and lower it for one second. And let's say you're walking down the street and talking to somebody and say, 
And he's like, yeah, can you, can I have your time for a moment? And then just say, just take a light dumbbell. That sounds like really bizarre, you know, just, just for the sake of it, explanation and curl it for one second and lower it for one second. And they ask the person in front of you, is that fast or slow? You know what they're going to say? Slow. Mm -hmm. Because the thing is with a lot of these movements, slow training lulls the stimulus. Stimulus is the objective, but you got to be careful with it. Too fast will get you eventually hurt. You know, explosive movements, CrossFit, all that nonsense. Look at those bodies, muscular as hell. But the thing is, they're injured as hell too. Mm -hmm. So speed of movement should not, again, I've told you before, should not be pre-planned. But Going at a one, one pace. And if you told that to a super slow person, they would scream at you. They would say, you don't know what you're talking about, whatever, but really in essence, you'll never get hurt with that. You can't get hurt. Matter of fact, I've been to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of gyms and I've observed this stuff. I've observed people that do slightly quicker if you might speeds of movement and there was one guy i remember from many years ago he always pops into my head and he did the training routine that wasn't what we think ideal and i looked at him and i said he has reached his genetic potential based on his muscle lengths and his this whole body itself i could see he reached his genetic potential and there's a lot of people in the industry saying if you only did high intensity training that you grow man muscle well that's not so true and there's been i'd agree with that i've seen i've seen some things that have occurred in the past where people have tried that routine and lost muscle. And so the ideal, ideal training is again, no, unfortunately I use the phrase, no rules, just right. Are you, do you think that's because of the con though, mainly the conservation of energy issue, right? It's that we get too good at the movement, um, that, that, that we need more variety that in order to actually stimulate change. Psychologically and physiologically, a variation is a huge factor. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, psychologically, I mean, if you do the same routine day in and day out, which many, many people out there recommend, oh, you don't need to vary. Yes, you do need to vary, vary the stimulus because that psychological aspect of training is very important. And if you put people in the same routine day in and day out, it's not ideal. It's not ideal. It's okay. It's not ideal. I'm interested in ideal. Your listeners are interested in an ideal. Awesome. I could show you what, what I think is ideal. Uh, you know, take a few steps back and digest what I have to say, folks. Today's episode is brought to you by Imagine Strength, your one-stop solution for safe, simple, and effective high-intensity training equipment. When it comes to high intensity training, it's about the right workout machines intelligently designed for your studio. That's the specialty of Imagine Strength. Inspired by the legendary Arthur Jones, they've pioneered efficient and affordable fitness equipment perfectly crafted for your HIT business. With a team that lives and breathes HIT, Imagine Strength combines passion, innovation, and careful design into every piece of equipment, creating the perfect environment for an intense yet rewarding workout. So why choose Imagine Strength? Number one, they create innovative, tailor-made equipment for HIT Studios. Number two, they provide cost-efficient designs, making HIT more accessible. 
And number three, they're committed to continuous innovation and refinement so your studio never falls behind. Elevate your hit business with a team at Imagine Strength. Visit imaginestrength.com to discuss your needs and select the gear that'll take your business to new heights. Be a part of the hit revolution with Imagine Strength and see how their equipment can transform your workout experience. Well, tell us. I'm not, I'm, what's the ideal, David? Just to, that, what's tell that? us more. Tell us more. Like, well, tell us more. Like, what is ideal? How do we understand? How do we individualize ideal? Ideal is based on the individual. I have to, you know, you have to have experienced uh, practitioner figure out what's ideal. What's <laughs> ideal for you? You can't, I can't just throw one across the board. I feel like I we're going around in circles say, You know point. what? You know what? <laughs> and there's things I could do with you and your training that I can oh, improve. I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure. Uh, I, I mean, it's, but it'll be based on, it's based on some observations, some of the training videos, but listen, you're doing just fine. Thanks, David. I like better. I'm yeah. interested in better. I'm interested in the best possible case scenario for each person. Okay. Before we forget, David, give us a double bicep. Your bicep was looking fantastic ahead of the recorder. I know, I could only show you. Or a, sing, a single here. bicep because they're so large. Well, it's still Look at that. tremendous. Upper arms and, and David, do you mind if I ask how old you are? It's like here. Fantastic. Oh. How old are you? If you, well, you know, I mean, I'm, I mean, you know, it's funny. There's some people, there's one guy, there's one guy online. He, you know, all these bodybuilders do on, on Facebook is I uh, constantly showing off their physique. And I don't know. I just, you know, I was a bodybuilder one time. I, 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 I'm done with that. I mean, I'm little, well, I can show you old pictures. I, Show one recently just to show uh, just what I used to be bad back in the day. I still have a decent physique and I've been leaning down just a little bit based yeah, on. Yeah, I saw, I saw your picture you shared on Facebook of, uh, there's a picture you shared at the uh, end of last month and you said you were, and you looked fantastic and you were very tanned, very vascular, muscular, lean. Uh, and you said you were, this is like June 29th. And you said that you were looking to get back to that condition. Is that what you're sort of working towards then, is it? Yeah, gradually. You have to understand with, uh, I'm not a dietitian or anything like that. I'm not an expert in food, but basically you eat a balance of foods and you eat less of what you always enjoyed. It's, it, and that's my philosophy. Is You're very good at you that, know, though. You you're very good at your, I tell people, I tell people, what about diet? If they ever ask me about that, I said, you develop your eating habits long before I ever met you. The only thing you can do is eat less of what you've always enjoyed. There is, there's a philosophy in that called your life to enjoy. These people, I've seen them get ready for contests. One guy many years ago talking about eating cod again and again and again. He, feel, he looked like he was miserable. You look like they're killing themselves with these diets. Back in the day when I was a competitor, I used to stay in shape all year round so I wouldn't have to do all this crazy insanity that they're doing today. They, they bulk up, which is an old concept. That means you're lazy. You're just eating more food. You're just lazy. You're giving, you're, you're giving an excuse. I'm bulking up so I can gain more muscle. How the hell is that possible? I mean, adding fat to your body is going to make you gain more muscle. That's utter insanity. Mm -hmm. So the idea was if you were a bodybuilder back in the day, you stayed in, well, if you're an intelligent bodybuilder back in the day, let me put it that way, you stayed in relative shape so you wouldn't have to kill yourself to diet down and get into contest shape. You were right next to it. And, um, we had a grand prix contest. I won the lightweight back in the early eighties. I won the lightweight, uh, Northern Ohio when I was living in Ohio. And basically I think the contest was, they had the grand Prix crease excuse me, grand prix style bodybuilding. And it was when you would every two weeks, you'd have to be in the show. So you have to be in shape. So in order to do that, you'd have to be in shape basically all year round. But today they make excuses. Oh, I need to bulk up. It's nonsense. It's BS. 
So you put on a lot of fat. Yeah, what I'm doing right, <laughs> what I'm doing right now is reducing my foods, eating a little less, a lot less sugar than normal, and um, you know, it'll, the chips will fall where they fall. But you can't be like Arthur Jones used to say, in an impossible hurry. You got to find out how long it took you to get in that, the condition you're on right now. You have to reduce it back gradually. That's the best way to do it. Do you track it? Is it all fit? No. You just know. No, it's, you know, you, you have an idea. For many years, I knew about caloric intake and, oh, I mean, there's so many diets out there. It's, 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 it's crazy. But you eat, you be, you know, the way I understand your diet is you kind of eat whatever you like to eat. And that includes like, you know, junk, not a, a fast food, let's say. But then you're just, it seems like to me, like I always remember Doug, I think it was on one of D Doug's old body by science blog, which I don't know if, it, I don't think it's even up anymore, but you can probably find it on the way back machine. Um, he, he had a post there or a comment that said something like he always admired your ability to just order a burger and chips eat like half the burger <laughs> and eat like two thirds of the chips and then just go yeah i've had enough like you know because you were mindful of your overall caloric intake that that to me still seems very that's incredible discipline david no you just if you do it right you, you'll you'll ease into that you can't yeah you know, i mean in honor of my, uh, one of my trainees who's seasonal, he owns 13 Burger Kings. So I've been eating Burger King lately, uh, for some reason it's fast, fast food only means it was just, you get the damn thing quicker. <laughs> That's what I but how, but for. To tell it's me efficiency of the service, to, tell me you're hungry, you want to eat. How do you do you it? Like, from... How do you, how are you, what is it that makes you uh, is it because of, is it a vanity thing? Is it because you're, and I, I mean that in complimentary way, like you're so driven to have a good physique or to be a good example. I know it's obviously a, a motivator might be the fact that it's your profession as well. So what is it that enables you to do this so much success consistently versus others? I have a decent genetics and. And I have discipline when it's needed. Um, what does that come from? Paint... <laughs> My father. What was your father? What did he do? My father was, uh, I got his genetics. He was, uh, oh, was a sales guy. He used to get up in the morning. He used to get up in the morning and do, you know, like push ups. And, and we had a gym in the middle of the living room uh, back in those days. And uh, I always tease people. I said, man, he'd be in there working out and we could smell his body odor that would wake us up in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, he was a physical, he was a physical fitness guy. So I basically, yeah, it rubbed off. Mm -hmm. Um, I, uh, I'm not sure if I would have been in this industry if I didn't have a decent physique and I saw what it was doing, I could have done anything else, but I found that I had a genetically decent physique, not a great genetics, but decent enough to you know, to do what I'm doing. And it, it, uh, it was, it, I was always interested once I got into it that, and I become really obsessed over what works best. So if I've heard that right, do you think you were more motivated than the average because you could see the potential in your physique? You know, you've, you've been obviously you're in incredible condition many times in your past. The pictures are all on Facebook for everyone to see. So is it, is it for you? Is it, I know I can achieve this great physique. Therefore that motivates me to abstain with my diet and to be disciplined about it. So part of what's happening. Oh, is it just, it, 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 I mean, it was there in the DNA. I mean, it just, you know, I, my brother said, oh, you're looking a little bit blah, blah, blah. My brother and I said, uh, not to go into what he's doing right now. As far as diet, I can't say that, but I said, I told him, I, I'll do my thing. If you, uh, add a few more vegetables, I just gave it up <laughs> and a bunch of vegetables and fruits, your diet there, you weren't going to do that. So what I said is I'm going to gradually, uh, take it down. 
And oh, is um, he calling you it's fat? Just, it, 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 it's just almost like an alarm goes off in my head. Okay, you had too much fun already. Time to get down. Interesting. Simple as that. It, it's almost like a it, it's almost like a seasonal thing to where, okay, you've had enough fun. All right, time to ease down and get into some better shape. Yeah. Now, David, I don't bring this next point up to want to talk politics. Let's not talk politics. I yeah, rather not go there. But you like your politics. You like to have a good rant on social media about your the current affairs, right? Your personal opinion. Does that not does those types of things get you stressed out? Kind of where I'm going with this is there, is there events that happen in your life that stress you out, piss you off, which then might cause to you to derail you, right? To lead you to overeat. I've, for instance, the way that manifests for me is young kids can be very stressful, right? <laughs> um, sleep deprivation, for example, made it difficult for me to be as disciplined in my eating over the last few years as I would have liked to be. Now, I, like you, have quite favorable genetics where even if I put on weight, I still don't seem to look like I put on that much weight because of the way I store body fat. And maybe it's my metabolism and other things. Um, but yeah, I'm just curious, do you not get stressed out by events? As politics was the first thing that came to mind that then causes you to, you know, fall off the wagon, so to speak, and overeat. Or, or how do you manage that? Love to hear more about that. Does, does, doesn't have anything does to do probably. with it. No, it doesn't, doesn't. No factor. What bothers, obviously, you get angry with the current state of affairs, obviously, you do. Uh, but it doesn't cause me to eat more or less. Doesn't change that at all. You just look at it and and, and discuss. Uh, it's not. And I again, I'm not getting into po politics, but I will tell you, <laughs> Careful. it's not. It's not ignorance. It's pure stupidity. Having done the bio, biographical research and historical research on this as well. Um. Again, I told you before, there's nothing new under the sun. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I do it out of selfishness. I'm interested in raw knowledge. I'm interested in the truth. Selfishness, selfishness merely means that I have a great deal of self-interest. That's all that means. And I'm interested in that information. I'm interested in it. And uh, the way I go about understanding things is not the culture today, is what happened yesterday. Mm -hmm. that, that, I, that, but that's... it doesn't bother me. I don't need any more or less. Yep. I'm just I... focused in on, on, on that stuff. Of course, I'm, of course you get angry. Of course you get frustrated. Of course you... Uh, but, you know, I had conversations with people to where I don't argue with them. I just get them to understand what I've discovered. And it actually has turned them. If they're, they say to me, God, you're intelligent. I said, well, I don't know about that. And I said, and one, one guy said, man, I, I'm surprised you spoke to that guy like that. You're so like calm and even keel. Well, I was just explaining to him what is and what you see see remember television is not the news on television should only be one thing to you they may do some research that are derivatives that you're unaware of but you must have a foundation television by and large should be only one thing entertainment absolutely Let's park the, that stuff there for a second or indefinitely, David. <laughs> but it is, it's interesting all the same. Um, I want to make sure we get through some of the submitted questions, if that's okay, by, uh, by a couple, couple of people on Facebook. Oh, by the good? way, yep. Mark Houghton, is that his name? That's the guy. Mark Houghton? Yeah, Mark, he's been on the show before. That guy's yep. awesome. That guy, that, I, I've had a conversation with him. He, he's I, I, like I said, he knows he's going to get a steak dinner once he comes to the states he's, he's gonna a, get the best i can buy him man he's, he's in, awesome he well i don't know what he's like right now but he's been in absolutely phenomenal shape for his age um mm -hmm. and, and uh he's still a young man mark i don't mean to be disrespectful uh but 
yeah, he he's, he was a great guest on the show quite a while back now. Um, so let's start with, I think this was from Mark. Where do hit trainers and athletes typically go wrong when trying to build muscle, David? Again, we're going to go back to dosage, trying to find the right amount of dosage for each particular athlete or individual. Um, building muscle is a fine line. You got to be careful with that because remember one thing, there's a lot of cost when you're carrying that muscle onto the field. But remember one thing about that. Ideally, what I said is there's a fine line. But However, there's an even playing field out there, so to speak. They all train the same. I'm getting a little bit off, off uh, his okay. question just for a second. But I'm just saying that if you look into what's going on in major professional sports here in the United States, I'm sure over towards you as well, they're all doing this insanity called CrossFit. Mm -hmm. And they all, um, but they indiscriminately, they just follow the leader with it. So it's an even playing field for an intelligent athlete or an intelligent bodybuilder to do that. You act, have to experiment with, with the bodybuilder. You have to experiment with more set applications. As I mentioned before, some of these pro the protocol that I mentioned to do which you let me let, let the cat out of the box, but that's all right. I'll let you do that because I know that I'll put you in, I'll put those in position that want to visit when they visit South Florida, they want to come and find out how to do this thing. They'll freak out once they feel the, the results from it, but high intensity training actually is really good for the athlete because you're not wasting your time in the gym. Okay, so there is some value to high intensity, one set to maximum fatigue training because most of it's done once or twice a week. So a lot of the stuff in athletics is done every day. It's too much. So you have then the bodybuilder requires to experiment with the high intensity bodybuilder with more sets based on their individual situation. Experiment with a few more sets. Experiment with no thinking about slow speeds before the stimulus. The idea is to direct the work towards the anatomy and to stimulate that and not think about speed of movement. I'm not saying explode during the movement, not at all. Um, take a few steps back and say, um, the people that advocate slow, take a few steps back and just say, you know what, I'll try what Landau has to say. And I understand you. a lot of people make money at the slow, high intensity. But for yourself, then if you're a bodybuilder, experiment with a few more sets. It's not going to hurt you. Like I said, the high intensity guy is not going to come down on a bolt of lightning to get you. That's where I see it. So with the athlete, yeah, if you want more muscle, but you got to be careful with adding more muscle because it has a cost. It, 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 it takes your body. Uh, it, it, you're, you're putting more muscle on, but you are carrying that muscle onto the field of play and i used to think there was there there was no such thing as being muscle bound but there is in particular cases there is okay you can't put formally a ronnie coleman out on the playing field they'll knock him dead over he can't move. He can't move the today, unfortunately, so well. But uh, but if you want to build a better body, getting away from the sports, you must experiment with more set applications. 
that doesn't mean you spend your life in the gym. There's a certain amount of dosage. The idea of once or twice a week or three times a week is fine, but training more often than that is not prudent. I hope that answered it. Yeah, I think that was a good answer. Um, let's go on to the next question. So kind of a more of a, well, say beginner question. I'm sure this, the answer to this would be interesting to everyone. How much do we warm up before doing a big five? You know, the big five routine, right? Absolutely. How you much do you warm, warm up? up? At all. You don't know, not at all. Okay. Walk in the gym. Why is that? Your ability to produce force in each exercise is rather high, obviously. Okay, you're fresh. It falls all under the realm almost of specificity. The action taken during the first few repetitions of an exercise gets you ready t towards the end of the exercise itself. You know how people say, well, get on, get on it. Stretch. Stretching is counterproductive. It's unnecessary in any aspect whatsoever. Not necessary. 1992 Olympic trials for track and field had every chiropractor, every stretching coach, all those experts. I remember this happening way back then. And many of them pulled up lame, injured, being prepared for their sport. Yeah. So a lot of the stuff in the, in the late 1960s, not when they won the championship Super Bowl, but New York Jets, they are, may have been around 1970. They hired a stretching coach. See, that was the in thing back then, the early 70s, was stretching coach. They proceeded to have the more injuries than ever in their program's history. Interesting. Probably before or since. So stretching's not necessary. Warming up on any particular thing. You get into the exercise, that's the building workout, uh, built into the workout specific to the task itself, task specific warm up. That's all you need. Interesting. Very good. Thank you for that, David. And, um, can we, uh, same person, can we lightly exercise during our rest days? Yes. Cause you're not impacting your body's so-called recovery. Recovery is a crapshoot. It is very difficult to figure for each person. But light exercise, basically, that's just physical activity of any particular type will not impact that. Mm -hmm. Love it. Succinct. And um, there was a question about Arthur Jones, and I kind of elaborate on it a little bit. I'd love to hear... What's your last memory of hanging out with Arthur? When he was well, I suppose. Well, I only caught up to him around 2000. So he's had seven year, more years after that to live. I oh. love the story. I, we, I went over there to visit him by myself. I can't go into detail on some things he told me because oh. they're too much for this. But we sat around, there was a book um, written by a guy, uh, Shizmansky, and at the time, oh, let me go here one second. That's okay. You're fine. Um, let me get this back one second. Second. Here. Second. Second. Anyways, I visited him and he was, he was looking at the book by Shizmansky, uh, that was written about Arthur Jones. It was a biography written about Arthur Jones. He threw it aside. He liked Brian Johnson. Um, Brian Johnson's the collection of the Arthur Jones collection. He loved that. He loved that. And he was sitting there. We get reset this. Sorry about that. You're okay. Um, he was, um, 
watching the uh, Turner Network uh, classics on TV. And he loved that. He was watching that. He loved the old movies. He loved that stuff. And like I said, he liked Brian Johnston's, um, his, his stuff. He didn't like with Shizmansky's stuff. He said, ah, that's no good. Yeah, that's no good. Then we sat around, uh, Inga was still alive at the time. And we sat around and he goes to me, he turns to me, he goes, would you like a cup of coffee? I go, oh yeah. From Martha Jones, sure. So he, uh, so he made me an instant coffee. If you pay me some coffee, I love that guy. And uh, he says, "Are you hungry?" I go, oh yeah. He says, uh, "I'm gonna send Inga out for uh, McDonald's." So he brought back the McDonald's. We sit in our little table chairs and eating, eating McDonald's hamburgers and salad and that. And, and uh, they come to be about six o'clock at night. I said, I said, I, I, sorry, Arthur, I can't. He said, well, you want to stay over? I thought, I'll wish I could. I got to get back home and get to work. And I said, no. he wished I'd stayed. One thing about Arthur, and an interesting parallel with, with, uh, and people might think that's not true, but it's true. Parallel with uh, Hutchins is that he liked me. He really did. Because I know what he how he reacted to other people when we brought them over. And, you know, he, you know, he, but he, he, he liked me and I was able to instigate some of the stuff that came out of his mouth. I used to kind of sneak in some, you know, like, what do you think about this, Arthur? What do you think about that? I was the, I would orchestrate, um, a lot of the conversations through, um, when we had a few other people come over with me, I was the orchestrator, but I could tell that he liked me, but that wasn't unusual because I could tell you something with my own father year before he died. I had a West point tape in there with Arthur speaking in the car as I drove with my father. And when we shut the car off, my dad said, Oh, that guy's great. I love that guy. And I said, I guess it's, you know, it's runs and relativity. So yeah, it was always really good to see the guy. Cause you know, years ago I sent off a work for, and I had a, the guy that really turned me on the Nautilus back in the day was James Gucci flowers. Some may be, may have heard of him. He was a personal friend of mine, and we used to do the secret Nautilus Arthur Jones workouts uh, at the YMCA after we closed it up. And uh, and I said, uh, Jim, if it weren't for you and this Nautilus, he said, I he said, hey, you would have figured it out sooner or later. So, you know, and Arthur loved him too. What what is like? Uh, I'd love to hear. What were the, what, what were the, what's the, um, best piece of advice that you ever got from Arthur? What's the, the things that really stick in your mind, things he said to you? Don't believe me because I said, or anybody else said it, apply it to your mind. In other words, been critical. Arthur gave you, Arthur gave you a platform to stand on okay and he said by the way don't believe me because i said it all the great speakers and thinkers will tell you that i always say don't believe me just apply it to your mind take a step back i'm not right about anything and if you say i'm wrong and you prove i'm wrong I'll be the first one in line to tell you I was wrong. I'll be the first one. So that, that whole saying there, basically that's what I use. Mm -hmm. If anything in this conversation 
that you think I'm wrong about and you can prove I'm wrong about it, I'll be the first one in line to tell you I was wrong. Fair enough, David. Um, so one thing I wanted to get back to is, um, you know, obviously we're talking about training ourselves, training clients, how that's difficult to give advice on unless you're really there, watching the training taking place and then giving advice in real time and really shaping it to the individual. I thought a better alternative then might be to talk about a trainee you have, keep them anonymous, if you will, but maybe we could talk about their last workout and you could give us what a workout kind of looks like with you. I know it's different every time I get it, but just to see or describe one person's workout set by set, rep by rep would be an interesting insight into what it's like to train with you for those who are never going to get the chance to go to Miami and train with you. All right. So is that something okay, we could I'll, take? I'll, I'll, I'll give you one. I'll give you one. Yeah. yeah I, I want, I want each I'll, exercise. I'll give you one on, uh, on, on, on John's workout. Let's do it. John's been around in a long time, so he knows what to do. All I do is place John in a present, better position to receive better benefit from training. And he has. He has. And basically what I'll do is, let's say if he's on a leg press, and I'll see ranges of motion, I'll see his range of motion, and I see when he's entering the most difficult repetition. I might freeze him at three quarters of the way or two thirds of the way back towards lockout. Uh, and I might say, move it down about an inch and hold it right there. And he'll, and I said, while you're there, lock yourself up down into the seat or else even before that you can slide up on the seat. If it's uncomfortable in the positioning itself, I, I adjust that as well. I give him free range. Conforming yourself to a seat is may not be anatomically right. You might move your move yourself up a little bit just to comfort some particular areas, the lumbar and buttocks. But I'll find a spot for him that just hold isometrically. Um, then when I see him start to creep down, I said try and produce positive force all the way down. Uh, in other words. Negative is the direction of movement. Positive force is what you're trying to uh, trying to push it back out towards. And when he's done, he's done, he's done. And a lot of times I'll I'll take a look at certain things in the workout. Once in a while, I once in a great while I'll say, yeah, that's okay to breathe a little bit. But I do the same thing. I might hold my breath. But you'll correct yourself during the workout. And, uh, certain aspects I want to shut down the set or he basically shuts it down at the, uh, at, towards the low in the moment he shuts it down, but there'll be particular points in ranges, like in an overhead press, where you'll, you'll look at an anatomical and say, stay right there about like three inches from the top and just manifest that hole. You'll know at the end of set. That's where you start to coach and make the calls. During the set itself, it's motivation, encouragement subtly to make sure that, yeah, then that they know that you're seeing it head to toe. Sometimes I'll, I'll say, kind of drive your heel through that or something like that. But it's basically individual, and that's what I do with him. And when he's done with the last workout I did with him, he immediately, oh my God, that was a great workout and shook my hand. I said, well, I'm just trying to get on your page. That's all. I'm trying, trying to find out what works best for you. Can we go, where was his last workout? This is, uh, who did I work with? I think it was on Tuesday. So can we go through his workout, like set by set? Just so, just, I mean, I know the listeners would love to see. Can I video that? You say, are you saying? No, no, no. I just mean, let's talk through it. Like what oh, was the first? By set. Yeah. What was exercise one? What was the protocol? What was exercise two, three, four? You give Can me a second. Can I reach in the bag? Let me see if I got Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yep. Just bear with me. Bear with me. Yeah, go back in the back and get the chart. 
Sounds good. If I can find that chart, let's see if we can find these charts there. I've actually had people that are so incredible that they actually ch keep charts of their own workout. Yeah. Believe it or not, I'll have mine, they have theirs. Hold on. Tell you what it was. You want to hear the sequence of this? Yeah, I want to we hear the all the details. Well, basically what we did with him last time, we did, okay, you did 12, you might say it's the daily uh, or infrequent 12. That seems to work real good, 12 X's. For some reason, I don't know. It seems to be at, there at, at least him, he's at the end of this. It, it, no, the last set is always called last call for alcohol, by the way. Yeah, this is it. This is the <laughs> last one. So I use that for, I use these phraseologies. Okay. What, what, I'm, what, 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 before you get into it, that's a great phrase. I usually say to people, this is it. So milk it for all it's worth. I say stuff like that. I'd love to hear what else do you say? What are some of your other phrases you might use during the workout to like connect with people or motivate people? Well, like I said, the, you know, uh, no rules, just right. No one to say when, um, let it all hang out and then get more. Or I'll say Arthur Jones once said, if you think with, you're done with the last rep, try and get one more after that. Uh, something to that effect, but I'll say that, uh, with his workout. Yeah. You know, I can't think of some of the things I say. I just uh, automatically, it, it is basically, it's like, remember the phrase caller driven talk radio. Uh, it's like, Ever heard that before? No, I've not had that before. This is, they, they drive the instruction. Okay. The trainee drives my instruction. I'm not. Oh, I see. You know, they drive what I have to say. Well, of course. Okay. Yeah, it's you're not, tailoring. It, it, it's not pre-planned. It's not, I don't I have no idea. It's, it, they drive it. So if I've got leg press, leg press, uh, descended, two sets. Leg extension hang on. with the protocol so leg, alternating. Leg, leg, hang on, leg press, say that again. Leg press, two sets. Two two sets. Now I have an alternating leg extension afterwards. Mm -hmm. Now, why did I do that? I don't know, because I'm, I'm, I'm out of my mind. I saw his legs needed, needed some quadricep and today and instead of hamstring emphasis. Then I uh, did, um, two, uh, actually three descending sets. These are heavy duty multi, uh, joint movements that eventually, uh, you know, like just suffice everything. So I did three applications on the chest press. Then I went to a dumbbell. Man, well, well, hold it, hold it there, hold it there. So leg press, two sets. Then you did leg extension, alternating single leg, is it? That's it. One, actually two, two sets, actually two. Yeah. Okay. And then what was next? Three applications of the chest, chest press descending. What does that mean? Oh, descending, like breakdown, like drop sets. Yeah. Well, not in a row, but, you know, give him a little bit to catch okay. his composure. Kind of like a, red, a, a drop set with a pause in between. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Then yeah. we, uh, then because I, when you walk in the gym, then when you got a guy like that walks in the gym, I, I, I really didn't have anything planned. I, I'm thinking, I'm looking at it and I go, let me just do this. And as it goes on, I'll do this. Mm -hmm. Um, dumbbell pullover, three applications. Um, I'll tell you something after this. Matter of fact, I projected something for his next workout. I, I may stick with that. Uh, and then, uh, finished up with overhead press two sets. So that's a dozen exercises, a cumulative stimulus. Okay. Because mm -hmm. if you go through the same one set or every, every same day, same thing, body senses that, picks it up as a grind, as I say. So I had, what was I going to say at the end? I, I thought I was 
at the end of his workout, you could see he was, he was done. He, that's it. That's all he had. And that's why we call it last, I said his last call for alcohol. <laughs> yeah. I might steal that one. Yeah. This is the last call for alcohol. That's it. It's a good this one. Is it. Let it out. All hang out and then get more out of this. Okay. Could you, and could then, you, sorry, David, could you give us some commentary on these? So I wrote it all out. I wrote out the number of sets for each movement. I love to hear you just give a light bit of commentary. So if I know maybe you don't know if it's hard to easy to remember, maybe you've got notes on the workout card, but maybe you could just give us a little bit more color. So when you were doing a lug leg press of two sets, what else did you do during that? Did you throw in an advanced technique? Were you looking for something in particular? You actually talked about how he slid up and down the seat for comfort. That's interesting. I'd love to well, hear that yeah. for each exercise. Yeah. Well, you know, I'll make them aware of that if it's more comfortable for you to slide up a little bit, because I've done that myself on machines before yeah. just to protect your lower back. These machines are not fit for every leverage and every person's leverage system and physiology. You don't have to conform yourself to the seat. You may, if that feels better. And if you slide up a little bit, if it's, if feel the pressure on your back feels better as far as where your back, lower back is on, um, the techniques are in my instruction is that, yeah, of course I'll tell them that's an option. You don't have to stick with the option. You, you could actually. Grab those hand grips and pull yourself down into the bottom of the seat like a vice grip. Mm -hmm. You're going to say, oh, it's going to elevate your blood pressure. Exercise does that. You'll adapt to that. You'll adapt to it. Okay. Olympic weightlifters exponentially raise their blood pressure incredibly up into the hot uh, hundreds, 200, 300 momentarily. So. The thing about blood pressure is yeah, temporary. I see. But yeah, it's just, okay. I will give you another one on this, on this workout and the pull over mm. with the dumbbell. You've done, a, you, you know, you're familiar with them on a bench, right? With oh, the dumbbell yeah. pull over. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I give him the option of not pulling it above his forehead. I, sh I shorten the range to where he comes partially all the way up. Once you start the release, which isn't really bad, but I want to get some real fine, heavy duty intensity. It's about three or four inches short of your forehead. It's a short range to the moderate stretch behind it. You'll find a difference in doing it that way. You'll like that. Not to pull it over your head, rest, and go back down for rest. If I do that to him, he sees the difference, feels the difference, sees the difference, likes the difference. Um, yeah, all the same thing with overhead press. Towards the end of that, uh, the last set, I probably about three and about four inches short of locking out maybe five i'm not sure exactly the length i i told him to hold it right there isometrically and uh, park his back up against the bench you can and then again you gotta produce maximum positive force the direction is negative now i got a real thing about negative if you have enough time to talk about that you know, we need to wrap negative up in like training. one minute, David, but if you could be, yeah, if you keep it really quick. Negative like training, way. negative training is only good in the last repetition. The emphasis on negative training is only good on the last repetition. In the aspect of positive and negative. Get out of that negative if it doesn't feel like it's doing anything. Get the hell out of that negative phase of action, unless you're loaded up to the gills. Get out of the negative phase. It's a lull in the action. It's a lull in the stimulus. Place more emphasis on your positive than your negative, believe it or not. Sounds good. I don't just disagree with that. Um, 
David, this has been great fun catching up as always. Some real nuggets of wisdom dropped in along the way. I feel like sometimes I can ask you a question. It might not get answered very directly, but you'll end up saying something that's really valuable anyway. So I appreciate that. And this has been quite a bit of fun. I actually quite enjoyed our little uh, argument, shall we say. Um, There's and... no argument here. Oh, well, no. You agree I... with everything. You agree with everything I have to say. There's oh, no argument. Uh, you're absolutely right, David. I agree with 100% of what you said today. <laughs> no, there's a few things. Yeah, everybody but... agrees with me. I mean, listen, listen. listen. All <laughs> I'm interested if in is providing the... I'm interested in is providing the best workout. I never thought about this when I was younger. In the industry for so many years, I said, you know what? Let's find out what works for that individual. The key is the individual, not the group, not the fancy routines. We're doing this today. We're doing boot camp. We're doing whatever. No, I want the individual to improve. Okay. And that's what it's all about. Individualism. And I can tell you as someone like yourself, who talks to our colleagues all the time, I feel like almost everyone completely agrees with that. To be honest, um, there might be a few businesses I can think of that are very cookie cutter where maybe it's less of that. Uh, but I think the vast majority actually agree with that idea. Um, and with that said, David, for people who want to find out more about you and learn about your consultation services, that kind of thing, they can go to your Facebook. So you just search David Landau on Facebook or email you xarchives at AOL.com. And for everyone listening, Please subscribe to your, on your favorite podcast app. It takes like 10 seconds and really helps this podcast grow, helps more people learn about HIT and uh, see David's enormous biceps uh, and also build a HIT business. Uh, <laughs> why do you shake your head? Are you not, not, not so not bad? Or... <laughs> I just laugh about it. That's all. <laughs> um, and remember, everyone, to grab your free step-by-step -step PDF guide on how to turn your HIT business into a robust referral machine. You can download that now over at highintensitybusiness.com forward slash ref, short for referrals. You'll also get a full length video training with Luke Carlson from Discover Strength. So that's highintensitybusiness.com forward slash ref. And lastly, to get the show notes for this episode, please go to highintensitybusiness.com and search episode 422. There'll be all the things that David's mentioned, links to his, his, uh, his email, his Facebook, et cetera, if you want to get in touch as well. And until next time, thank you very much for listening. And David, thanks so much for taking the time. Really appreciate it. You got it, man. All right. Let's go, let's go, let's go. This episode is brought to you by Imagine Strength, your go-to for safe, simple, and effective high-intensity training equipment. Growing a successful high-intensity training business requires workout equipment that's not only high quality, but also intelligently designed to fit the unique needs of your studio. And that's where Imagine Strength comes in. Drawing on the wisdom of the legendary Arthur Jones, Imagine Strength has crafted a groundbreaking line of fitness equipment that's as affordable as it is efficient, giving your studio the upgrade it needs without breaking the bank. The team at Imagine Strength breathes hit. Their passion for high intensity training shines through in their designs, which they've consistently refined and innovated for optimum effectiveness and user experience. From my personal experience at REC, I can attest to the careful consideration and craftsmanship that goes into every single piece. My Imagine Strength workout was absolutely brutal, in a good way, of course. Now, what makes Imagine Strength truly stand out? They have innovative equipment tailored for the unique needs of HIT studios, affordable and efficient designs, lowering the barriers to entry for a HIT business, continuous innovation and refinement, ensuring your studio stays ahead of the curve. Founder Jeff Turner and his team are dedicated to moving the HIT industry forward, and making strength training accessible to more people than ever before. Here's how you get started. Number one, visit imaginestrength.com. Number two, discuss your specific needs with the team. And number three, select the equipment that will propel your business to the next level. Head to imaginestrength.com today and give your hit business the Imagine Strength edge. Be part of the hit revolution and see firsthand how their unique equipment can transform your studio's workout experience. Elevate your hit business with Imagine Strength. Let's go.